Well, hello there, good people. It is so good that you are joining us here at Kensington Community Church for our worshipful experience on this, the fourth Sunday of Eastertide, the first Sunday of May. And as you can see behind me, we are getting our sanctuary ready for a very big moment. It is this Sunday. We are recording on Friday morning. It is this Sunday that we are going to be beginning live in-person worship here in our sanctuary and our audiovisual technicians who we partner with here at Kensington Community Church are very busy getting the space ready. So today's worshipful experience, we're going to be going to different locations around the church. Uh, maybe some locations that you haven't seen in a while if you are a long time member of the church who has been attending for some years. We'll be in the office and in and, 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 and one of the Sunday school classrooms, the kitchen, Lander Hall, so that you can kind of get a sense of the entirety of the campus. But it is my prayer that you and yours are safe and well this day, that you have worn your mask and washed your distance, washed your hands, got that vaccine when you've become eligible, and that, so that we may care for the least of these in our midst and keep each other as safe as well as possible. I also want you to know on this Sunday, on this day, indeed every day, that no matter who you are or where you come from or wherever you are in your journey through life, that you are loved unconditionally and steadfastly by God, that we love you and miss you here at Kensington Community Church and hope to see you this Sunday uh, and that you feel the presence of the risen Christ in your midst. I want to invite you to go to the front page of our website, kensingtonucc.com. It is there that you can sign up to join us on sun at Sunday worship. It is there that you can see the totality of our prayers and announcements and the ways that you can plug into our church's mission and ministry. It is there that you can make a tithe or an offering to help support our continued mission and ministry here at Kensington Community Church. But of course, there are a few things that we would like to lift up to you this day. So I would invite you, sisters and brothers, kindred and neighbors, let us take a moment and listen and watch today's announcements. Hello and welcome to Kensington Community Church and this week's announcements for May 2nd. Can you believe the time has finally arrived and we are worshiping in person? Please remember just a few things. We have limited capacity, so we do need you to reserve your space for each worship service so that we can comply with the county guidelines. You can call the KCC office or check the Chimes newsletter for the link to reserve your space. Please be mindful of the time changes for the worship service starting tonight, May 2nd, and they are 8.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. We ask that you continue to wear your mask and keep social distance protocols. We will continue to make our worshipful experience available online for those who are just not quite ready to return. And lastly, Pastor Daryl and Barbara are still looking for ushers to assist on Sunday mornings. If you're feeling called to help, please reach out to either one of them. Women's Spirituality meets at 10 a.m. the first Tuesday of the month via Zoom, and that's happening this week on May 4th. We are reading Diana Butler Bass's book, Freeing Jesus. You can find a link to the book and a link to the interview about the book in the weekly chimes or on the KCC website. Led by our very own Paula Elizabeth, you are invited to gift yourself the gift of time to listen to the still small voice, a time of growing closer to the holy, a time of being still. Join this evening, May 2nd service and the first Sunday of each month following. The service tonight includes a spiritual reading or two, followed by a time of silence for contemplation. We invite you to find a quiet place in your home where you can be restful for about an hour. That's a quiet corner, a comfy recliner, wherever you are comfortable. Light a candle, dim the lights, play some soft music. Let your spirit find calm and a haven for the hour of renewal. Allow this time to refresh you, renew you, reinvigorate your very being. May you use this time to draw closer to a knowing of spirit within you and guiding you. There is always so much happening in the life of our congregation. Be sure to check the weekly chimes and KCC website for updates and Zoom links. We welcome all of you back into our sanctuary when you are able to and feel safe to do so and have a blessed week all.
Friends, we begin our worshipful experience on this, the fourth Sunday of Eastertide, around the table of Christ. We are found here in our kitchen, where many of us might not have been for a while, but we have set up this meal, this sacred and blessed, mysterious and mystical meal of breaking bread with each other in community. Today's story is about the raising of Lazarus from the dead, but many of us are not aware that following this story, really a, a twin to its story, is the story of Mary and Martha and the risen Lazarus breaking bread with their friend Jesus around a table of friendship and fellowship in their home. It is a reminder of just how special and just how wondrous it is to share a meal with friends. So your good friend Jesus, your good friend Pastor Darrow, your good friends here at Kensington Community Church, those who have gone before us and those who will come after us all gathered this day at this table in a meal, for a meal, that Jesus shared with his disciples and friends many, 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 many times. And he shared on that fateful night when he was betrayed and that night, he gathered his friends around the table. And during the meal, he took the bread and he blessed it, saying, Baruch atai Adonai Eloheinu molach olam, hamatzah mekalim haaretz. Blessed are you, O God, creator and sovereign of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it. And he passed it among his disciples and friends, saying, Take, eat, all of you, for this is my body broken for you. And likewise, after the meal, he took the cup, and again, he blessed it, saying, Baruch atai Adonai Eloheinu Malach Olam, Berei Peri Hagafin. Blessed are you, O God, creator and sovereign of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. And again, he passed it among his disciples and friends, saying, Take, drink, all of you, for this is the cup of the new everlasting covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you gather around this table and you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, remember me. Friends, neighbors, sisters, and brothers, I invite you now to take your own communion elements as we share in digital community this sacred meal together. I will be using one of our COVID-safe communion sets that we will be using this Sunday as we gather and worship and for live in-person worship for the first time in a long time. So sisters and brothers, This is the bread of heaven broken for you. And this is the cup of love poured out for you. Friends, we gather here in the Sunday School classroom for the pre-K through first grade class at the altar table that Miss Marcia has set up for our wee little ones to go to God in a word of prayer and gratitude and thanksgiving for these simple yet sacred elements of bread from the earth and fruit from the vine that fill us up with the things of Christ, of peace and joy, of hope and love this day. As we gather in prayer, of course, we bring those prayers that are on our hearts and on our lips this day for people in our lives, our community, our nation this day. We continue to pray for the people who are walking through this pandemic. We particularly pray for the people in India this day. We pray for the people of Chad. We pray for the, the, the migrants, the unaccompanied migrant children who have made their way to our borders that they would be ministered to with kindness and with love. Many other things that we pray for this day, but let us now go to God in a word of prayer from around our tables, bringing those joys and those concerns to our loving God at this time. 
Around our tables, O oh God, we gather in joy, peace, love, and with hope, ever present in our lives. Holy God, you cause the earth to bring forth an abundance of beautiful and nourishing food. Thank you for your overflowing generosity to all of your creatures this day. Bless the holy meal in which we share around the table of Christ, around our own tables. May this fellowship give us strength to our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. During our time of worship, O oh God, indeed around these tables, we come to learn and to grow. We offer our, our, our lives and you nourish us, creating a space within us so that we may feel your love and peace this day. May our worship around this table, in our different spaces, across digital community, draw us closer to you. May we abide in you this day, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer, and it is in you that we pray and that we may abide in every moment of life. So in times of sadness, loss, and disorientation, in times of anger, betrayal, and slander, in times of hopelessness, brokenness, and failure, in times of hope, hopelessness, in times of a lack of faith, in times of being the, needing reassurance, this day we come abiding in you. In times of forgiveness, happiness, and thankfulness, in times of joy and unity and peace, we abide in you, O oh God. Your love is ever-present in times of deepest despair, as well as through the vastness of your grace. Your invitation to abide in you has no qualifications for promises to be ever-close and ever-present when life is at its best and when life is at its worst and in every moment in between. O oh God, we pray, abide in us as we abide in you. These prayers we bring to you, O oh God, for we were taught to bring everything to you in prayer when Christ Jesus, Jesus taught us these ancient and sacred words to pray. Our God who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Save us from times of trial and deliver us from all that is evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, oh, friends, sisters, and brothers, we are traveling in the footsteps of those who have gone before, but we know that we will be reunited on a new and sunlit shore. Some say this world of trouble is the only world we need, but I know I'm waiting for that morning when a new world is revealed. So saints, let us go marching in at this time.
morning. How are you doing? In this time when we're coming back to in-person services and you've been in school for three weeks, I just wanted to ask, how's it going? I wonder what things feel the same and what feel different. I wonder if you notice more differences. Do you notice that it's harder to hear people wearing masks? Do you notice that it's quieter in your classroom than you're used to? It's not as lively and everybody's not talking. Maybe you hear the teacher a lot more than you used to. Or maybe you have those moments where you wanna reach out and touch somebody, or you wanna give a hug and you retract. Yeah. This is a different time and it's confusing and disorienting. It's just not quite the same. When I think about this time in your lives, I think about Mary and Martha. I think you're a lot like them. You see, they were feeling confused and disoriented when their brother Lazarus went from being, you know, sick and dying, and then he passed away. And then all of a sudden, Jesus came and resurrected him. And they just weren't expecting that to happen in that kind of a way, even though they really wanted their brother back. So it was confusing for them and disorienting too. When a person is taken from you or regular parts of your life are taken away, it's really difficult to put the pieces back together. You like Mary and Martha deserve time because you're riding a new wave, right? There's this new moment and you're learning something, you're making mistakes, you're not quite used to it, you don't feel balanced, but you deserve time. You are allowed this time to make mistakes and to try and to really live into this moment. Yet again, this year, you are doing hard things. So instead of a prayer today, I want to do something a little different. Each day, this is your prayer. I am doing hard things today. You're going to put your hand out and say that. And with this hand, you're going to put it out. You can do this with your family. I really want you to do this with your family. And you're going to say, this is the thing that happened today that didn't go so well. Maybe it was a mistake or somebody hurt your feelings, something like that. But you're also going to say, this is the thing that went well. Even if that thing is, I got my teeth brushed so I could get on the bus and get to school or I could, so I could just get there on time. <laughs> That's the good thing. Because right now, it's important to look for the good things. And that's the word of God for today. And all God's children said, Amen. I'll see you next week. Our sacred story today, for the fourth Sunday of Eastertide, is the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. It is found in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. Listen for the word of God for you this day, for God is still speaking. A certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Their brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, This illness isn't fatal. It's for the glory of God, so that God's Son can be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was. After two days, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's return to Judea again. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. 
Jesus told her, Your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, God's Son, the one who is coming into the world. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying, and those who had come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, Where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. Jesus was deeply disturbed when he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been dead four days. Jesus replied, Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they will believe you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. Here ends our reading. This is the word of God for the children of God. Thanks be to God. This past weekend was the very first time since I adopted Willow that I was away from her overnight. I have to admit, I was a little bit nervous. I was up at Camp Stevens leading the church retreat up there last weekend, and it was the first time that Willow hadn't been fed by me since last April, the, last, the first time that she had gone to sleep in the house without me there, that she woke up in the morning to go potty without me there. But she did great. She did great. And my friend who watched her said that she was well behaved and she was cuddly and she was a weird and a spaz, you know, just like the Willow that I've come to know and love. My friend watched Willow from the comfort of Casa de Kistler, kind of pulling double duty for uh, house sitting and puppy sitting for me. And being the responsible person that my friend is, when they left my place at 10 a.m. last Sunday morning, they put Willow in her crate, they closed up all the windows, they locked all the doors, and they turned off the ceiling fans, making sure that the house and Willow were nice and secure until I came home at 2.30 p.m. Willow is crate trained. I believe in crate training a dog. Willow is crate trained and her crate is in a little nook in my house. Now she was in her crate for about four hours. Not the four days that Lazarus was in the tomb in the story that Joe read for us this morning. But when I got home and I walked over to the little nook where Willow's crate is and, 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 and where she was in her crate and I bent down to open that crate up to let her out, calling out as I always do every single day when I open up the crate and let her out, Willow, Willow girl, daddy's home. There came this waft of strong doggy dander coming off of her and coming out of her crate, I said, good lord, girl, you stink. And my house stunk. It stunk like dog. And the air was stale and stagnant. And so I went around opening up all the windows and all the doors and I turned on the ceiling fans and I lit one stick of frankincense to rid my home of willow stink and to fill it with the sweet aroma of one of the baby shower gifts that Mary got at Jesus' birth. I hate the, dog, the smell of dog in my house. It's one reason why I don't bring Willow to my office, because I don't want my office to smell like Willow. I work really, really, really hard to make sure my house and my office does not smell like dog. But don't let this face fool you. 
This pic right here is of her right after her latest spa treatment day at the dog wash place. Willow is nothing less than an 85 pound stinker. And she stinks up my place. But it's amazing actually. As you go through your day, the range of smells available to us on a daily basis. From sweet and sour and fragrant and rancid, spicy and stale, it spans the gamut from life to death. Our noses and our brain receptors that work in tandem with our noses are located in our noggins right next to the portion of our brains which store and house memories. This is why of all the senses, sight, taste, feeling, uh, hearing, that smell, its smell is the sense that can trigger a memory faster than anything. I remember walking into the office where we lit the candle at the beginning of our service today, walking into the office one day last fall when Donna, our office administrator, was putting some lotion on her hands. The aroma coming off of, of Donna's lotion immediately transplanted me to 8530 Oak Timber, San Antonio, Texas, circa 1993, as I walked down the hallway of my house past my sister's bedroom that always smelled of Bath & Body Works cucumber melon lotion. It happened. Just like that. Just like whenever I smell aqua velva aftershave and I am transplanted to right outside my grandfather's bathroom. And it's not just good smells and pleasing smells that do this. Burnt rubber in the air, I smell that, and I immediately get triggered into PTSD of a car accident that I had in my early 20s. An accident that honestly, sisters and brothers, I probably should not have walked away from. This sense of smell and memory are like this. They are conjoined, they are linked so intimately. I know that is true for me, I bet it is true for you. And you know what has really distinctive smells? Churches. Oh, you walk into a church, like really a really old church, and you can just smell something different. It's different than any other smell you might come across. I think the smell seeps into the kitchen, cushions and the pews and into the wood of the altar table. And I wonder, as we gathered this weekend in the sanctuary in Lander Hall for the very first time in a really long time, I wonder when y'all come in if you will feel as if it smells the same. Or will it smell clean or disinfected, safe and secure from all alarms? Does it smell like your church? And does it bring back memories, both good and bad and everything in between? And one of the most unexpected tragedies of COVID-19 is how the virus has attacked people's sense of smell, leaving them, some of them, with lengthy periods, unable to smell anything good or bad. And so our heart goes out to those COVID long haulers those who have still not received and gotten back their sense of smell. We pray that your sense of smell returns post-haste. The Lazarus story that Joe read for us this morning features co-mingled sense of life and death. Powerful odors from the most pleasant to the most putrid. I never actually was aware of that fact. How many times have I read the, the Lazarus story? This is probably my fifth or sixth sermon on Lazarus in the, my professional career. And I was never aware of just how many times smell is brought up in the midst of the story until I read a commentary this past week preparing for this sermon this day. How many times smells are mentioned in chapter 11 and chapter 12 of the Gospel of John? Those two chapters are really meant to be read as one story. How the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Jesus, all in the town of Bethany, and that how this story can be told through the recounting of a series of smells. Chapter 11 may include one of the funniest lines in all of the Bible, made only more funny by the poetic lyricism of the old King James Version. Lord, he stinketh. Lazarus has been entombed four days when Jesus orders the stone rolled away. Politely but firmly, Sister Martha does the math. Lord, come on now. 
After four days, the spices we've used to anoint Lazarus' body will be overwhelmed by the disgusting stench of our own brother's decaying body. But Jesus will not be deterred. The tombstone comes off. The terrible stink comes out. And Jesus prays, probably with one hand over his mouth and nose. And yet suddenly, remarkably, four-day-old death gives way to new life here and now. Lazarus comes out, of his, comes out in his grave clothes, smelling to high heaven. But nobody cares. The spring-like fragrance of fresh life deodorizes the entire scene. Then Jesus demands that he be loosened, that Lazarus be loosened from his chains and his bindings, allowed to roam free. Oh, the sweet nectar and smell of freedom. And speaking of sweet fragrance, the next chapter, chapter 12 of the Gospel of John, is set at a dinner party at the home of Mary, Martha, and the risen Lazarus. There around the table with Jesus breaking bread with his friends, Mary um, takes, takes a moment to anoint Jesus' feet with perfume. And not a dab of perfume, mind you, but 12 ounces of pure, costly nard. Imagine a soda can full of perfume dumped on Jesus' feet, pooling in a puddle around him. The gospel says the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. So here in on Eastertide, the fourth Sunday of Eastertide, in the light of resurrection glory, which still emanates from Easter Day, as we begin live in-person worship again and we get to, get to feel a little bit more comfortable in our new normality of our day, can you smell, sisters and brothers, what Jesus is cooking? He's cooking up what love looks like. He's cooking up what love feels like. He's cooking up what love tastes like, what love sounds like, and what love smells like. And why this love that he's cooking up for us is broken and shared with you and why that matters. It matters because there has been so much this last year that has stunk. Just stunk. The pandemic and over 3 million deaths worldwide has stunk, and it continues to stink. We pray God speed in the of this day. Not being able to hug our loved ones has stunk. Grandparents haven't been able to, to hug their wee ones for months. Friends have had to be distanced from each other for months. That has stunk. The community health authorities in the ancient world told Mary and Martha that they should not touch the dead for fear of their health. And our community health officials in the 21st century warned the living from embracing each other so that we would not tempt death. Mary and Martha must want to hug, hug their brother Lazarus so profusely and so powerfully when he walks out of that grave. But they don't know if they can. They, just like we want to hug each other this day, but we don't know if we should. And that, well, that just stinks. And how many of us long to be with the dying as they crossed over and went home to glory, but couldn't? because of the lockdown and the travel rest restrictions. And that just stunk. How many of us echo the sentiments of Mary and Martha begging Jesus to act on behalf of their brother so that they could spend just one more moment with, those, with the one that they love who had been taken and gone on before them? How many of us would ask Jesus to do the same for us if we just got the chance? It stinks all of the job loss that occurred this past year, all the mental and emotional health that cratered this past year, all the domestic abuse and violence that occurred behind closed doors as we sheltered in place this past year, how the school year was upended this last year, how the pandemic exacerbated the gulf between the quality of learning and schooling that the privileged and private schoolers receive and what our children who go to poor public-based education systems are offered, not to mention how vastly different 
teach the level of support that teachers got depending on which educational setting they found themselves in. Stinketh indeed that does. We learned this past year that the stench of Jim Crow still reeks in our country, though it has a more sophisticated odor these days. It reeks less of the old putrid Jim Crow and has a more, let's say, refined scent of Dr. James F. Crow Esquire. But don't, but, 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 but frankly, let me speak frankly here, even this new fragrance really doesn't pass the smell test, does it? And it stinks. All of the fake news, false propaganda, fear-mongering that has happened around the rollout of the vaccine. And no, mo no more does that stench of misinformation and misdirection, subterfuge and subtle lies waft more than off the lives and the talkings and the mouths of fundamentalist leaders who, who, who shared their prosperity gospel to the detriment of our common good. Good Lord, they stinketh. But now, after 60 weeks, 60 long stinking weeks, yes, 60 weeks, I counted. I went to a calendar and I counted. It's been 60 weeks since we have been in our sanctuary together. Here we are in this moment together. Maybe some of us forgetting to shower because it's been so long since we've had to get cleaned up from church to come to church. Maybe we're like Mrs. Jones here, coming to KCC to bask in the glow of the Good Shepherd window and taking the sweet aromas of our campus and her robe and her slippers, her hair all out of whack, thinking, oh my, my, I didn't know it was going to be live today. And this feels like a happy ending. And it's great to have a happy ending. A final infusion of fresh air. But if those four long days that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus experienced, if our own time in our own tomb, stuck behind our own stores, tells us anything, it's that these times of unknown of in-between time, of being sheltering in place is not so easily forgotten. Our frustration with God's sense of timing is one of our greatest spiritual struggles. The writer of Ecclesiastes certainly wrestled with this. You know the familiar text. It once was a song. For everything there is a season, a time under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to weep, a time to laugh, and so on. Fourteen couplets about time's ebb and flow. And then the writer of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes concludes, God has made everything suitable for its time. God has put a sense of past and future in our minds. We instinctively sense something about God's timetable. And yet, here's the kicker, friends. We cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We know that God has a purpose for every moment, but most of the time we don't know what that purpose is. That's what really bothers the author of Ecclesiastes, and if we're honest with ourselves, it's what bothers us as well. We humans, among all of God's beautiful creatures, have the capacity to contemplate the passage of time and our own mortality. But no matter how smart we get and technologically advanced we become, we remain unable to know for certain what tomorrow will bring. So sisters and brothers... Kindred, kindred and neighbors, let me be the bearer of good news for you this day on the fourth Sunday of Eastertide, as we are now able to walk into our sanctuary as we continue to walk through this pandemic. I'm pretty sure what Jesus has loosened us from is the bondage of the need to live in the past we cannot change or a future we cannot control, but to live in the blessed present God graciously gives us this day in the here and now. We need not waste our precious time worrying about what might have been or what might be. We have to let those things go. Let us be loosened from those things. God rather wishes us to be free, to be faithful to, and trust in the eternal now. What does this fresh moment that God has gifted to us, what does this critical hour in times such as these offer to us this day? 
It's about this moment. It is about this now. This joyous moment of celebrating life and all of its complexities and diversities. Like Lazarus who has returned from the dead, we might never see our friends again. But here we are laughing and talking and laughing and talking together. So let us enjoy this moment. Let it not slip us by. Let this poignant moment be filled with love. Like Mary, like Lazarus' sister Mary, Mary who poured the perfume on Jesus' feet. Like this Mary, we cannot contain ourselves. We have to let it flow. Let it come out of us and let it flow freely. Let us be like Mary who knows that she might not have another chance than this one. That she's not going to let this moment slip her by. Time is short and there's no guarantee that we'll get any more. So in this moment, in this right now, let us show how much we love God and how much we love each other and how much we love ourselves. Because in this moment, it may indeed be our last chance. This moment is precious indeed. So sisters and brothers, friends and kindred, let us catch the revitalizing scent of life and love amid the stench of destruction and discrimination. Let this moment be a precious moment for us. Don't resist it. Breathe it in. Exhale all of your doubt and despair, your anger and anxiety. Inhale the deep, fresh, cleansing breath of God's vibrant Holy Spirit. God's fragrance of love and grace Mercy and justice fills our house of worship this day. And it fills you up. And fills me up. Fills us up. Fills the entire creation up with the sweet fragrance of life. And that is the good news. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you.
Friends, our worshipful experience on this, the fourth Sunday of Eastertide, is coming to a close. And so it is my hope that a word, a song, a prayer, the sharing of communion, the seeing of the different places and the different aspects of our campus and our church this day has filled your hearts and lifted your spirits and, and, and has inspired you to live in this moment in the here and now and to breathe in the sweet fragrance of God's love and let it fill you up. But as our worshipful experience on this, the fourth Sunday of Eastertide, does come to a close, we go to God one more time in a word of prayer. So let us now receive our benediction this day. Sisters and brothers, may God bless you, may God keep you, may God's countenance and light and love shine upon you and guide your path through life. May you feel God in your heart and see God face to face this day as you behold the wonders of creation. May you receive the gift of grace, grace enough to risk something big for something good so that we may have peace, a lasting peace today and all of our tomorrows. This we pray in the name of the God who was and is and will be forevermore. And all of God's children said, Amen. Our worshipful experience has come to an end, but you know what that means. It means that our service now begins. How do we go out and serve God and neighbor with peace and love in our hearts? First, we are going to wash our hands. We're going to watch our distance. We're going to wear our mask. We're going to get our vaccine when we become eligible and then we are going to go make peace, go be peace, go share God's peace this day, this day, right now. Amen, amen, and amen.